this king of glory that pursues me with his love and haunts me with each hearing of his softly spoken words and my conscience a reminder of forgiveness that I need who is this king of glory who offers it to me King of Angels, oh blessed Prince of Peace, revealing things of heaven and all its mysteries. And my spirit said, longing for his grace and your Bible. Make sure that you're here with us for that. It'd be an awesome time to gather together around that table that, uh, that Christ came to save us, given his blood and his body for us. So come out next Wednesday for that. Uh, have you guys seen these yet? We're getting together all our food or our shoe boxes for our outreach to uh, Hermosillo, Mexico. We're putting together shoe boxes with uh, gifts and little games and, and school supplies for the kids there. 
as the Calvary Chapel there in Hermosillo will go and now reach out to those kids this Christmas. So if you haven't grabbed one of these yet, go pick one up at the back counter. There's one in the flyer rack on the side here. And fill up a box, bring it the first Sunday in December and the first Wednesday of December. We'll collect those. And then we'll be in prayer that God would use those to touch the hearts of families down in Mexico. So great opportunity to reach out this Christmas. Let's pray. We'll ask God to go before us this evening. Father, thank you for this time together tonight, Lord. We do uh, uh, thank you, Lord, as your children, that we have a reason to be thankful this Thanksgiving. Lord, because you came and died, because you rose again, we're able to not only have life, but to have life more abundant. So, Lord, as we gather together around your word tonight, Lord, may you fill us up, Lord, with not only thanksgiving, but with your word. Father, may you equip us for every good work. And, Lord, as we go out tomorrow meeting with our family and friends, Father, may you use us to share the, the good news of the gospel with them. May it not only come out of our mouths, but, Lord, may it be in the way we act and the things that we do as well. So, Lord, we want to be more like you. So teach us your ways tonight, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Let's all stand. Let's magnify the name of the Lord together. done. 
You came running, looking for us, and now there's nothing, no one beyond your love. You're the overflow, you're the fountain of my heart, so let your mercy reign, let your mercy reign on us. You have done great things.
us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not
see your power in the moonlit night where planets are in motion and galaxies are bright we are amazed in the light of the stars it's all proclaiming who you are your beautiful face and everything. And we thank you tonight, Father, so much for loving us, for giving us your only son, for not holding anything back, for saving us with your unconditional love. Despite our flaws and our dysfunctions, Father, you loved us. And ask, Father, tonight that you go before Pastor Jack as he comes to teach us from your word and ask that you would just speak boldly through him. Convict our hearts tonight, Father. Lead us to the cross, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Happy Thanksgiving. Y'all ready to break your diet? <laughs> what diet? Well, Lord be willing, we have a great, exciting year looking ahead. Uh, it, it looks like our building's going to start in about the middle of the year, so... I know, wait forever, huh? But anyway, praise the Lord. So everything's going well. You can keep that in your prayers. Uh, you probably have heard Frank Prestori got in a pretty bad motorcycle accident. If you haven't, he was hit by a car. Some lady, I don't know what she did. He was in the fast lane on the 210 going home Monday night about 7, and some lady just either yanked her car, lost control, went right into him in the fast lane and knocked him off his bike and landed head first in the divider. And then he's broken lots of bones. He's in a coma. And uh, we told the family that we'd be praying for him. It looks, he's, he's getting, improving as far as some of the vitals are, but he's in some pretty critical condition. So 
We pray with him, pray together for him tonight, shall we? Father, thank you for uh, Frank and for his ministry, certainly over the years. We pray that you would be with him tonight in the hospital. Uh, Be with that woman who hit him. I'm sure she doesn't know what to think of herself tonight either. And that you would uh, touch Frank's family and be with them, give them great comfort, Lord, at this time of the year, especially as they face all of the family things without dad being home. And just bless, Lord. May you heal him and raise him up. May you intervene and... uh, and strengthen, and may you just be who you are, God. May you be strong for him tonight. And raise him up, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, shall we open our Bibles tonight to Genesis chapter 38? Joseph was a teenager when the Lord began speaking to him in dreams. And I guess like most kids that age, he was naive enough to believe that somehow sharing those dreams with his brothers wouldn't have an adverse effect. His dreams were fairly simple. He had dreamed that the Lord would one day have all of his brothers bowing down before him, and even his mother and father. And his brothers got angry, as you might suspect. He had already been favored by his father, Jacob. Um, Last time when we finished, we saw Jacob sending his young son Joseph, 17 years old, to go see how the other boys were doing. They were 50 miles away from home in Shechem, where they had used to live, a place they really didn't belong. But they had property there, and they had animals there, and they were caring for them. And so while they were tending to the sheep, Joseph arrived only to find out they'd moved 12 miles further north um, to a place called Dothan. And, And from the middle, really, of nowhere, they saw him coming from a long way off, and That hatred of the brothers boiled over. They said, you know, we could kill him and no one would know the difference. Make up a story. And and Reuben was able to talk him out of of, of doing that. But while Reuben, the eldest, was gone, Judah convinced all of them that it would be more profitable for them if they just sold him into slavery than killed him. What good would that do us? So they they did. They pulled him out of this old abandoned or or maybe unfunctioning water hole, if you will. Um, They sold him to an Ishmaelite tribe who was moving to Egypt and they handed Joseph off, who was then handed over to a, um, an Egyptian guard who was serving Pharaoh, an officer. And at 18 years old, he is a slave in a faraway country. In fact, the word officer, um, at the end of chapter 37 there, verse 36, is the word for eunuch. So he was made a eunuch because he worked around Pharaoh's women. It was a fairly common practice. It may explain some of his wife's behavior later on. Tonight we want to look at chapters 38 and 39, and they're, they're about as odd together as, as you can be. They, they are stories of lust and deception and worldliness. One, that Judah falls by and falls for. The other, that Joseph triumphs over. So they are tremendously in contrast. They are definitely R-rated verses. If your young kids are in here, they probably shouldn't be. Um, not making any apologies for the Bible. God wants us to know all things, but you know, kids are better off learning at their own level. So if you're 35 and can't handle it, go over to the fourth grade right now. <laughs> <laughs> On the heels of verse 36 of the last chapter, the one that we looked at and finished last time, where, where we read the words, now the Midianites had sold him to Egypt to potter for an officer of Pharaoh and a captain of the guard, you would expect the next chapter to give you information about Joseph since you just kind of started on the road with him. But what you get instead seems horribly out of place. You know, we might be anxious to know what becomes of him, but what we are given rather by the Lord is chapter 38. It is a story of older brother Judah, the one who had initially decided to to sell Joseph into slavery. It, It is the only story that we have from this side of the family for the next 20 years. From chapter 39 forward, for the next 20 years, we're going to hang out with Joseph. And it isn't really until 20 years past that we will then find them together again. So we get one chapter looking back to Jacob's home in that area, and then we get 20 years of Joseph and and all that, that the Lord did with him in his life. So chapter 39, we'll pick up the story with Joseph during the same 20 year period But first we get this chapter, which is here for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it's certainly a great contrast between faithlessness of a man that was going to be a tribe of Israel and and the chosen people of God, and the faithfulness of Joseph at his young age 
And Joseph, I think we mentioned to you a couple of times now, is only one of two people in the Bible, significant characters that have nothing written about them ill. You know, there's no sin, no failure, no faltering, no stumbling, he and Daniel. Secondly, it gives to us the continuation of the lineage that will bring us to Jesus, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that gene genealogy is spotlighted in Ruth. We will run into it again in the life of David. It will ultimately be set before us in the lineage of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 1. So, you know, if you're reading the Bible for the very first time, maybe you're a young Christian, you might read this chapter and it might stun you. Really? What is going on here? But it shouldn't. God's interested in sinners. So you qualify. And he's interested in us. And we have great hope. And God doesn't gloss over our sin. Now, when you get to the New Testament, like to the book of Hebrews, the book on faith, you find how God views our life. He, he covers by his blood the, the sins that, that have befallen us. He glorifies his work in our lives that are the result of faith. So what you read of Abraham in Genesis, not always good. You won't find those negatives in the book of Hebrews. Same thing with Joseph. Same thing with Jacob and others, uh, with Moses. So God writes it all out, and even biblical heroes like Abraham fall short because Jesus came for sinners. Chapter 38 is a chapter that is rarely read publicly. <laughs> it, it, it records the great deeds of shame, and God desires, I think, that we see its ugliness. Reuben, by the way, was Jacob's firstborn. He was his, his eldest. He would have stood in line, I think, for the birthright had he not had an affair with one of his father's concubines after his father's wife Rachel died. So you might remember that back in ch chapter 35, he had moved in on one of the concubines. And in chapter 49, when we get there and Jacob brings his you know, pronouncements from the Lord to his family, Reuben is, is uh, unstable as water. He's never able to make a proper choice. And, and his father speaks to him about that. Judah would be next in line, second born. But he will be set aside for these things. However, of all of the tribes that the Lord might have picked to descend through, the Lord picks Judah. <laughs> it is an act of grace almost too unbelievable to be so, but that's how grace works. So we get the lineage of a... You know, most families have an uncle they don't want to mention. You know, was he your family? Yeah, I think some distant relative. You don't want to be too close to you, you know, because they're so goofy. The Lord goes out of his way to pick Judah and then goes, look what Judah did. You're kidding. Yep, that's my guy. Oh my Lord, how gracious are you? And so, totally true. Verse 1, it came to pass at that time, at what time? At the time that, that Joseph was sold down the river, that Judah departed from his brothers and he visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Now Judah, and I don't, we're not really told why, but maybe he was increasingly uncomfortable watching his father Jacob grieving while he's holding those two silver coins in his pocket from the sale of his brother. I don't know. But he moves away from the guilt and from the conviction eight or ten miles away. He stays with a heathen friend that shows up three times in this chapter. Once as an acquaintance, secondly as an associate, thirdly as an accomplice. Just kind of got more and more involved with this very worldly guy. And Judah saw, verse 2, that there was a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her, went in to her, and she conceived and bore a son and called his name Ur. If you're pregnant and wondering about names, there's one. <laughs> she conceived again and she bore a son and called this name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Shelah, Sheila, no boy wants to be named Sheila, Shela. And he was at Chebzib when she bore him. So Judah sells off his brothers, at least he was the ringleader from what we gather and what we're told in the scriptures. He then comes home with a bloody coat and lies to his father about the death of his favorite son, who wasn't dead at all, he'd been sold. He then moves away from home eight or ten miles because he, he can't stand the grief, I, I suspect. And then he goes, of all things, and he takes a wife from the dreaded Canaanites. Now, now, the Canaanites, that's a big name for a bunch of different tribes that lived in the land, but they were the most vile and pagan and, and horror as a people that you could ever imagine. They sacrificed children 
and the fire. They had sexual prostitutes that they worshipped at the throne of their gods. It was as bad as it could be. In fact, the Lord would eventually take his people after 400 years and say to them, destroy everything in the land, everything that moves. Let nothing survive. It had gotten that bad that their sins are filled up to the brim. So he marries into that kind of a life, the Canaanite life. And then to make matters worse, her influence over the family, as we continue to read, becomes greater and greater as the children day by day become more like her, not at all like him. And they have absolutely no spiritual interest in the God of Judah, who has a heritage like no other. You know, he, he's the only one there in that family that believes in one God. He, he has seen what that God can do. The first child that we were making fun of his name there in verse 3, but that's a Hebrew name. The other two children are, have Canaanite names. The word Ur means to watch, or someone who is watching. Onan means strength. Shelah means position or, or, or petition or a breakaway. It literally means to, to like ask to be let go, and it, it almost suggests, and even further from the removing, uh, if you will, in his life from the Lord. So, um, Judah. Now, we jump several years ahead to the time where the boys were of marrying age. We we're not told what happened in the interim. But we are told in verse 6, Then Judah took a wife for his firstborn son, Ur, and her name was Tamar. And Ur, who was Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Now, like I said, we don't know anything other than Judah at some point chooses a bride for his eldest son with this Canaanite woman, picks a woman named Tamar. The word Tamar means palm tree. So I don't know if she was tall or... I, apparently she was a beautiful woman. And, and if Judah was seeking the Lord, which he was not, she would have been a spiritual woman. But, but Ur had no interest whatsoever in the things of God. None at all. And we're not told what wickedness brought God's judgment, but only that he was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Those are pretty strong words, aren't they? I mean, I, I have those underlined in my Bible with a question mark and a uh-oh. This is not good. You know, that the Lord would bring judgment. It is the first place we read of in the Scriptures where God kills an individual, and he does it without any explanation, which you think you'd read, Right? That, you know, I got, it's, it's kind of like the Lord said, I got my reasons, move on. No explanation given, no explanation necessary. Now, it's not the last time this happens. In, in Leviticus chapter 10, we will find Aaron's boys with strange fire on the day of the first sacrifice where, where God has sent fire down from heaven upon the sacrifice to consume it. And there's Nadab and Abihu lighting their own fire and trying to draw attention away from the Lord. And, and the fire that God lit from the altar jumped out of the fire pit onto these two boys, and it killed him. And the Lord said, Aaron, now don't you grieve, because he that comes to me must be holy, and he that stands before others must honor me. And, and they had done neither. And, and the Lord took their lives that day. And God made himself known to the nation by the, being the consuming fire. In, in Acts chapter 5, when the church had just started, there was Sapphira, right, and, and Ananias, who, who both had joined the church, were prominent members of the early church, had, had publicly proclaimed that they had some land that they were going to sell and give the money to the Lord and to the work of God, and then somehow told everyone how much the house or the property was sold for, which was apparently a lie. It was a, it was a ruse. It, they apparently kept more than they gave. They weren't obligated to give any of it, but they, they decided to tell them a big story so they looked good in the eyes of the church, would be great. And, um, they both came at separate times, you know, with this expecting honor from the people and clapping away, thanks for building the gym, you know, kind of build, put your name on it. And they both dropped dead at the, at the, at the door of the house that the church was meeting in. It. And, and then you read, the people were afraid to join themselves to the apostles. It makes perfect sense. But, but God again made himself known there as the church began. And then you can read in 1 Corinthians as well in chapter 12 about how those came to take communion and... The Lord says, because they weren't discerning my body, some of you are sick and some of you have gone to sleep. And it speaks about a judgment for approaching communion in a really, you know, kind of uh, non-serious manner where you don't realize that the Lord gave you this to remember his death. And so people were just, they were drinking and laughing and communion in the midst of all that. There was no honor given to the Lord. And 
Lord said, the kind of thing, some of you have died. He uses the word sleep because they were believers. But you died in the process. Well, here's another fella who just, without explanation, we just know that Judah's firstborn son and his wife Tamar, and he's wicked and God kills him. Verse 8, And Judah says to Onan, that's his secondborn son, now I want you to go in to your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. Now, the instruction of God to his people about this practice would later be written down and codified in the law of Moses. Uh, this one in particular is found in Deuteronomy chapter 25. But there are 34 distinct laws in Genesis that kind of come up out of nowhere, like this one, that will later find their way into the law of God as a practice both for the Jews and for the nation. And this is one of them, Leviticus, like I said, uh, no, Deuteronomy chapter 25. Uh, but it had been well established by this time. It was a practice that the Jews certainly understood. It was known by all of God's people. Succinctly it said that if a brother died leaving a wife without a son, that the next brother in line was responsible for marrying this woman, having children with her, but being sure that the firstborn son to her would take the place of the son that had died. He would receive the rights of inheritance. He would be honored. He would get the, you know, the father would hand down the, the responsibility of oversight. And it would be a responsibility in the family to keep that name of that family alive in that man. And like I said, it would later, you know, become law to the people. To refuse it, just reading ahead later on after the law is established, was an absolute insult. You were dragged by your family to the elders in the city gates. They spit in your face. They took off your shoes. They called you the one who had his sandal removed. <laughs> Doesn't sound too mean-spirited now, but apparently that wasn't good to be said of you. And so they would be dishonored publicly for refusing to honor God and family. And the application of the law, that particular law, the kinsman redeemer law is what it'll be called later, is, is, is seen in great detail with Ruth and, and Boaz later on. Ultimately, it's a picture of Jesus coming to redeem us. He becomes a man. He becomes our next of kin. He takes human flesh to be our redeemer. So it's a picture that will be replicated a lot as we go through the Bible. It, it is first introduced here as, as in common knowledge, well accepted. It was a practice that the Jews knew about, understood, and, and God expected of them. Um, years later in the New Testament, the Sadducees will try to use that law against Jesus to point out, for example, how foolishness the resurrection of the dead would be. And they quote this code of law. They say, well, look, a woman has a husband, dies, no children, marries another, dies, no children. And they make this thing absurd, right? And she has seven husbands and no children. And then she dies and, and then she dies and, or he dies and he dies. And in the resurrection, whose wife will this woman be of the seven who have died? And they thought they caught Jesus with the law, you know. And there in Matthew 22, Jesus said, you know, you, you're mistaken. You don't know the scriptures. You don't know the power of God in the resurrection. You don't marry. You're not given in marriage. You're like the angels. So they were astonished at his teaching. They couldn't grab him. But they used this very law to try to, to turn themselves against him, if you will. Well, verse 9, it says, But Onan, so dad says to his second son, You take now Tamar, your bro older brother's wife, have a child, raise up an heir. And, the, and then we read, but Onan knew that the heir would not be his. So in other words, his resistance is, if my brother has kids, he gets the heirship. If my brother has no children, I'm next in line, I get it, right? So I don't like this whole setup. Basically, that's his head. And so it came to pass when he went to his brother's wife that he emitted upon the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. It's a tough family to belong to, isn't it? <laughs> now, some have misinterpreted and mistakenly so taken these verses and sought to apply them to birth control, saying that any form of family planning or birth control must be unbiblical and displeases God. I appreciate your willingness to try to make a case for yourself, but that's absolutely foreign to the meaning of this text. You certainly aren't going to be able to build your house here. The issue here is not one of family planning, the issue is here one of family plotting. This guy wanted to keep the inheritance for himself. 
There was no interest. He had no interest in his wife becoming pregnant. And since Judah was the second born, and now the eldest son, Onan, saw no personal benefit in obeying this well-known practice that God had established in raising up a son to his brethren in the process, losing the rights of the firstborn, he didn't want Ur to be richer and better. He was against him in every way. So verse 9, the word when is the word whenever this was a regular practice. And, and the implication is when he went into her, that is a, it is a verb tense that means every time he went to be with his wife, he wanted sexual gratification without parental responsibility. So he marries her. He uses her. He has no intention of honoring her or obeying the Lord, and so he spills his seed each time upon the ground, defiantly so. I will not be a part of this. I will not obey. This is not what I want. And the Lord, not very happy with him either, kills him also. Well, Judah, the father, has now lost two boys, and, and the young one, fortunately, is not old enough to marry yet, but he's going, you're not getting this one, right? Now he's looking at Tamar like the black widow woman, you know? You get involved with her, you die. We read in verse 11, Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, You can remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah is grown. For he said to himself, Lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went, and she dwelt in her father's house. So, you know, he couldn't yet take that rightful place, but Judah has no intention of giving him to this woman anyway, because apparently he blames her for their deaths, not them. Uh, but he'd married a pagan woman, right? And he'd had this pagan kids, and he'd, he'd made this kind of home for them. And, and, and yet Tamar seems more honorable. She says, stay in your dad's house, and the minute that he's old enough, we'll have a third wedding. And we'll get that son and, and that heir for you and continue the name. But, you know, he had no intention of that. Well, verse 12 says, in the process of time. Time now goes on a little further. And the daughter of, of Shua, Judah's wife, the one that, uh, he had married that Canaanite woman dies. And Judah was comforted, and when he went, and, and he went up to his sheep shares in Timnath, he and his same buddy there, Hira, the Adulamite, the guy from verse 1. So sometime later, we don't know how long, uh, Judah's pagan wife dies and grieving. He doesn't turn to the Lord for comfort. He turns to his buddy. And, and, and his buddy invites him up to the celebrations that accompanied bringing in the harvest, and get your mind off it. Come on up. Let's hang out. It's a, it's a time of great rejoicing. It's when the money comes in. It's when the check is cashed, you know. It's when the payment's coming your way. It's the, the time of gathering. So he goes up. In verse 13, we read, And it was told to Tamar that, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnath to shear the sheep. And so she took off her widow's garments. She covered herself with a veil. She wrapped herself and sat in an open place on the way to Timnath. Uh, for she saw that Sheila was grown, and yet she was not given to him as a wife. So Tamar waits patiently. We don't know how long, but patiently for the promise of a husband. Sheila comes of age, doesn't, no movement, right? And now dad's wife dies, and he, he heads off. And she figures that it is about time to take matters into my own hands. And so her plan is, let me embarrass, if you will, my father-in-law. Let me expose Judah and his wickedness. And let me meet him at a place of celebration. Now, in the Canaanite religion, which he had married into and was living in the culture of, the use of these temple prostitutes was a common practice. You know, all you have to do is just read a historical book of any kind of the Canaanite period. They were perverted worshipers. They worshiped the goddess Ishtar or Ashtaroth, same woman, who was the goddess of fertility. And they believed that, 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 that worshiping this woman would bless the flocks and the fields. It would bring prosperity uh, to them. And so if you had sexual relationship with these temple prostitutes honoring the goddess, then your flocks and your herds would do well. Now you can imagine, I would think, men lining up for this religion, don't you think? This is about as bad as it gets. But this is the life that Judah had chosen for himself and for his family. This is where he had moved away from Jacob, away from the family, away from a father that after all these years was doing so well with the Lord. Um, in any event, Tamar dresses up as one of these 
prostitutes. She knew that Judah would be in that area. It was celebration time. Verse 14 tells you that her motivation. She is angry because she's been left out in the cold. She doesn't think her father-in-law is being fair with her. There's a man that should be her husband now, and he hasn't been. She feels like she's being used. And so that's her motivation. Now, I'll just give you a little insight. In a few weeks, when we get to some of the genealogy towards the book, back of the book, uh, and, and again in the book of Chronicles, Shelah actually married someone else in the family of Israel. So we don't know that it happened here yet, probably not, but that was where he, he ends up marrying someone that the Lord would have been happy with, if you will. Uh, but, but we don't know that yet. So she dresses up the part like one of the temple prostitutes, and she sits in the public eye, not mourning in her mourning clothes anymore, but um, available, if you will. Now when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot. She had covered her face. And so he turned to her, by the way, and said, Please, let me come in to you. He didn't know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? So I suspect that she knew, and, 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 and here's the testimony to Judah, that her father-in-law would be a likely candidate for, for services of this kind. She was pretty aware of the fact that, you know, this was going to work. This was going to secure her inheritance he sees her. He doesn't recognize her. He asks for sexual favors. She wants to discuss a price. We then read in verse 17, and then he said, well, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, what will you give me as a pledge until you send it? And he said, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, well, give me your signet and the cord and your staff in your hand. And so he handed them over to her, and he went into her, and she conceived by him. How much will you give me? I'll give you a goat. Imagine that. I don't have a goat with me. I don't want you to pull the wool over my eyes. What will you give me until I get your goat, so to speak? So he gives them the signet ring. That wasn't meant to be funny, but it's pretty funny. <laughs> and and, and she, he gives them the bracelet that he has on his hand of gold, and he gives her the shepherd's staff. Now, signet ring's big deal. Those are big deals. It's like you giving somebody your credit card. You know, it, it had a family crest usually. It allowed folks to mark stuff on cargo or to mark animals that, that it belonged to you. It would become the basis for wedding rings eventually where, where, where you know, those, those were worn to, to, to declare that, that you had made a covenant with another because these were covenant signatures, if you will. So he hands over the credit card, if you will, and, and his shepherd staff being a shepherd as well as some golden uh, bracelets and, and, and literally says, you know, let me leave this with you and, and then we'll consummate our agreement and then I'll send the goat back and get my stuff back. And she agrees with that and um, he has relations with her. She becomes pregnant, doesn't, certainly doesn't know it then. And he quickly gets up to leave and she promptly leaves and, and quickly goes, puts back on her garb. In fact, um, we read in verse 19, she arose and went away, laid aside her veil and put on her garments of her widowhood yet again. Verse 20, and Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his buddy there, Hiram the uh, Dulamite, um, to receive his pledge back from the woman's hands, but he couldn't find her. And he asked the men of that place, saying, where's that harlot who was openly here by the roadside? And they said, there's no harlot in this place. And so he returned to Judah and said, I can't find her. And the men of the place said, there's no harlot in that place. And Judah said, well, I'll just let her take him for herself, lest we be ashamed or found out. For I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. Look, I tried to pay up. No big deal. So Judah sends his ever-present friend hire to pay his prostitute debt. He returns to say she's not around. And Judah's not upset with what he's given away. Judah's upset with, I don't want to look bad. I tried to pay. He doesn't want to look like a snake. I think he looks like a snake already, but... You know, he's worried about what people will think of him for not promptly trying to pay. Very interesting. Uh, so he eventually gives up looking to her, for her. Well, let's skip ahead three months. And it came to pass that three months later that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. Furthermore, um, she's with child by harlotry. And Judah says, well, then bring her out here and let her be burned. No double standard with this guy. Now, news of her pregnancy brings cries of death from Judah as he sees her shaming his name and the name of his family. 
burn her. Really? It's his child. It's amazing how bad your sin looks on other people, isn't it? I'm always amazed that, that people can justify their own behavior because we have cause. We sin with explanation. But when that same sin is found in somebody else, oh man, are we upset. You know, we just think it's the worst thing. Have you seen the way he speaks? Oh, he curses sometimes. Well, you curse sometimes. Only if I hit my head and hammer. And I got a reason. It's amazing how bad our sin looks on other people, isn't it? All of a sudden, we're so self-righteous, but God knows. It, it reminds me of David, you know, when, when, when Nathan told him that story about the, you know, the, fella, the little kid who'd gotten his sheep stolen to feed the neighbors when the rich guy next door didn't want to kill one of his many sheep. And David said, well, that guy needs to die. And Nathan said, that guy's you. And then David went, oh, you're the man. He didn't want to hear, you're the man. You know, I know we say that playing, playing baseball, so, hey, you're the man. Not a good quote from the Bible anyway. You know, it's first found yelled at David for the wrong thing. Um, so he, let's burn her. That, that's pretty much his suggestion. Verse 25, when she, is brought out, she sent to, uh, when she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law, and she said, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose these are, the signet and the cord, or the bracelets, if you will, and the staff. So three months pregnant, I'm pregnant from a man who has these. Can you identify these, Judah? There's that signet ring with the big J in the middle, you know, or that bracelet to Judah on his birthday. Can you see that one? Mom, Dad, love, you know. <laughs> Who's are those, buddy? Uh-oh, these aren't going well. So Judah acknowledged them, and he said, she has been more righteous than I because I did not give her to Shelah, my son, and he never knew her again. So what a statement. Caught and embarrassed, he lets her go. He admits to his own sin. What else could he do? But I'll show you something. He doesn't stay with her. Doesn't stay with the, with the couple. Oh, she's going to have twins here in a little bit. He's gone. Has no involvement with these children at all. I, I think he just ran and, and, and hid himself. Yet notice that God writes it all down. You can't sweep it under the rug with the Lord's involved. But she has to bear it up by herself now. Doesn't give his son either to her ever. Verse 27, now it came to pass at the time for giving birth, six months more passed, that behold, twins were in the, room, in the womb, and so it was when she was giving birth that the one who put out his hand, the midwife quickly took a scarlet thread and bound it upon his head, saying, this one came out first. But it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly. And she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. And so they named him Perez, or breach. And afterwards his brother was born with that scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Um, now, that God would pick either one of these kids is, a, I think, a miracle of God's grace. The firstborn child was, the, re, was, was the, you know, the one that needed to be redeemed. He was the one that you would, as a parent, give a sacrifice for. Because he was firstborn, you couldn't offer your child. So you would offer a sacrifice to redeem your first child. And a scarlet play, uh, thread was placed on Zira. But when, when it came time to be born, Perez had slipped into first position, if you will. And to everyone's amazement, he was born first. It, it is Perez, this one who shouldn't have been born first and then was, that you find in the genealogy of Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew. And listed in that genealogy, we talked about the, the, the weird uncle no one wants to know about. In that genealogy, there are four women listed. Those aren't good to have in genealogies if you're a Jew. And they're all Gentiles, which is even worse. So you, you find Tamar there. You find Rahab, the harlot there, who came from a tribe that God cursed forever. You find Ruth the Moabitess there, and you find Bathsheba there. All of them in the lineage of Jesus. So here's this horrible story of these horrible occurrences, and yet out of that the Lord goes, I identify with these folks I'm here to save. So it's, a it's a beautiful picture of God's love and grace overruling man's weakness and, and failures and mistakes. But needless to say, it is a harsh story, and uh, it, it paints a pretty interesting picture of Judah, the one who was in the lineage of Christ. Well, fortunately, we can now turn to chapter 39, because for the rest of, of the book of Genesis, we will almost exclusively spend time with the life of David, one of the most faithful saints in the Bible, 
and, and quite a change from Judah and the mess he made of his life. So that's all we know, chapter 38, of the 20 years from the time Joseph is sold at 17, 18 years old till the time that his family comes to see him again, which will be many, many years down the road. He'll be 38 by the time that they see him again. So during those 20 years, this is the one story we have of that family. And then we have the story of Joseph who spends 20 years growing in faith. And it's this awesome, uh, in-depth, detailed kind of account of of a man's walk with God in the ways that he he would grow. So you literally can go from chapter 37, verse 36, to chapter 39, verse 1, uh, as far as the, 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 the flow, if you will. But God throws a veil over the 265-mile journey to Egypt that Joseph would have to make in the caravan, and he focuses on his child arriving at, at the house of Potiphar, who was an officer, a eunuch, where Joseph would become a slave, but because he is so faithful to the Lord and God blesses him, he would soon be in charge of everything. Now, just as far as like chronologically, so you can kind of think in terms of, of what we have, Joseph will spend 10 years from 18 to 28 in Potiphar's house. He will be a, 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 a servant, an ambassador, an overseer, a, a manager, an agent. He will run this house for Potiphar from the, from the time that he is 18 until the time that he is 28 years old, and we will follow him through the rest of the book of Genesis until at age 110, God takes him home. But he is, in every place God places him, a, a vessel of deliverance. You know, he brings freedom and joy and peace and, and blessing. Hope. Wherever Joseph goes, the blessings of God follow. Uh, just a couple of things to think about maybe before we read the chapter, since I'm sure you're well aware of what's in here. Uh, beginning with Joseph's age, I, I have a firm conviction that God has his eye on the heart of the youngsters. I don't mean 5, 6, 10. I mean teenagers and young men and women. That, that there's something about the way that God works in the scriptures that, that places a great amount of attention on the younger. You know, he was a naive, young, teenage kid, Joseph. He told his brothers everything in his heart. He shared it just without, you know, any shame. But he was willing to serve the Lord and speak up and and sometimes that's what you find more with younger folks than with older. I mean, Samuel was a kid when God called him. He was much younger than Joseph when God began to talk to him, and he began to respond. In fact, he lay in bed one night, and he just said, Speak, Lord, your servant hears. Young kid, and God got a young kid's life, and God used him greatly. Jeremiah, the prophet, was younger than Joseph as well. When he was called to go speak for 50 years, most of his life, to a nation that wanted nothing to do with God. And when he heard the Lord's words of chastisement that he needed to bring, he tried to excuse himself. He, he said, you know, to the Lord, I'm too young. They won't, I'll be afraid of their face. They, I've got no credibility. They won't listen to me. And the Lord said, knock that off. Pretty sure that's in there. I'll put my words in your mouth and don't be afraid of them. Daniel was 16 when God took him out of his home and took him to Babylon and began to raise him up in a foreign place. And yet Daniel would become the you know, the linchpin upon which the whole nation swung for a generation. He, he would be the leader and the voice of God for, for, for 80 years to come. Uh, no wonder Paul wrote to Timothy when he was 40 years old, let no one despise your youth. You know, there is something about if you're a young person, if you're willing to let God work, God can do great things in your life. I got saved at 19. I wish I'd have got saved at 12. Because I made a mess of things from 12 to, well, maybe not 12, maybe 14 to, to 19. Bad things happened in my life. You know, stupid, foolish moves. And had I just been saved before then and somehow committed myself to, I mean, I think all those high school summers I could have spent in the mission field. Instead, I spent, passed out in somebody's backyard, you know? What a waste of life. But, but there's something about young people when God gets a hold of them and he begins to stir their hearts. You know, maybe it's because you're impressionable when you're young and, and that's good, but um, there's something about, you know, you watch those that God uses and they're not all, they don't all fall in that category. Paul was certainly an older guy. And there are many examples of that as well to encourage us. But the younger people, you get excited about, you know. I, I remember reading Dwight Moody's uh, some of my, Dwight Moody's writings, and, and he wrote in one of his books that he came home from a crusade one night, and he walked in the door, and, and his wife said to him, honey, how many people got saved at the crusade tonight? And he said, two and a half. And she said, two and a half? Two adults and a child? He said, no, 
two kids and one adult. And she said, well, well, honey, what do you mean? He said, well, the adults wasted half of his life in the devil's kingdom. <laughs> so we only got half of him left. And then we got two kids who love the Lord. Makes sense, right? So it's biblical for becoming, you know, set in your ways, isn't it, when you get older? And, and, and mathematically, you know, if you're 25 years old, there's a 1 in 5,000 chance, statistically, that you'll give your life to Christ. But by the time you get to be 45, it's 1 in 60,000. And by the time you're 55, it is one in about 125,000, just statistically, because you just get set in your ways. You've figured it out. Your life's the way. You're harder to change. You want things just so. You that are older, maybe you recognize that of yourself. You just, you get picky about the things that matter little, but it's just the way you are, you know? It's just the way I like it. And I remember Grandma used to have to, I'd bring her tea, and if I didn't put it on that coaster, put it on the coaster! Why? That's the way I like it! All right, there, you know? How about next time I get you nothing? How how you like that, you know? <laughs> being a kid. But she was just locked in. Kids aren't like that, you know? And, and God gets a hold of guys like Joseph, and I, I think if Joseph had been 60 and this begun, he died a heart attack, you know? But no, the Lord had a pliable kid who was willing to, to work. And so, um, I don't know, think about yourself. How many, how many of you got saved after you were 25? Wow, how about before 25? Yeah, even. <laughs> we're well balanced here, apparently. <laughs> we beat the odds, the statistics. Yeah, I was glad I'm saved before I'm 25. I hear stories all the time, man. I could have been in much worse shape. So anyway, young kid, now he finds himself in a world of hurt. Verse 1. Now Joseph, I think we'll be all right, had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer, eunuch of Pharaoh, a captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. And by the way, you'll read that a lot as we go through Joseph's life. And he was a successful man in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And so Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. And so he made him the overseer of his house and all that he had was put under his authority. Verse 5, And so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord Bless the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field, and thus he left everything that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate, and Joseph was handsome in form and in appearance. A popular phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3, the Lord's hand was upon him. Now, there is no mention made at all of how hard this might have been for young Joseph to deal with. I, I would expect to read, I had a hard couple of months adjusting. No complaint, no questioning God. And, and if Joseph, you know, I always say to people, they say, who, who do you like the, the best in the Bible characters? I say, I'll tell you who I like the least, Joseph and Daniel. Because they're so convicting. I read Peter and I go, I can be Peter. I can shoot my mouth off at the wrong times. I can be Paul. I can lose my temper and start punching someone in the nose. That's easy. Joseph, I hate that guy. Because he's not complaining. I'm complaining here, aren't you? <laughs> really, you're not? Is it just me? <laughs> you, guys, you guys can lie with straight faces. <laughs> In any event, you don't read one word of, 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 of questioning of God at all. What you read is Joseph faithfully began to do his work, serving God, loving the Lord, bringing God's blessing upon himself, upon the people that he was serving, upon his surroundings, there's no, there's no mention of the horrible treatment by his brother, how, how unfair slavery is, how unright his imprisonment later will be. I mean, Joseph, if nothing else, was able at a young age to be convinced that God was taking care of his life. And so he, he set that aside, and he, he was diligent wherever he was planted, being the best for the Lord, even in unfair circumstances. When he gets to be 40 years old, in Genesis um, chapter 50, I guess, and, and his father has died, and the boys are pretty sure now that dad's dead, he's going to get even with them, you know? And they come to him in great fear, and he said, look, do not be afraid of me. I'm not God. As for me, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about what it is to this day to save a lot of people alive. He was able to say that 20, uh, 22 years later. I, I know that God had a plan. But he sees it at 18. You know, one of the things that challenged me about Joseph's life 
is that, that so often we, we, we find lots of ears to listen to our complaints because they're reasonable complaints, but they just don't work. No sense asking God why and what and where and what's happening to me. If you really believe God's in charge, then you rest, right? Joseph is the absolute example of rest <laughs> in the worst of places. I, I remember meeting Corey Ten Boom a couple of different times, and, and she was prisoner number 66730 at Ravensbrook, and, and most of her family was killed around her. It was a death camp. And the only way out for a Jewish sympathizer, believer, was in the smokestack at the crematorium. I mean, they were just being slaughtered. But Corrie Ten Boom, even in her own testimony, labored to be the best inmate she could. She did what she was told. She didn't gripe or complain. She didn't put up any fuss. She led clandestine Bible studies in barracks number 28, she'll tell you. And many folks on their way to their deaths gave their lives to Christ. Many were saved. I, I suspect millions more in the years that followed and read all of the stuff that she's written. But she's, she's kind of that example of Joseph. No sense complaining. Live for Jesus, you know. Live for the Lord. Do for him. He knows. And Joseph was diligent with glorious results. In fact, Potiphar saw it. And instead of converting to Joseph of God, which I suspect Joseph would no doubt have shared, he just put Joseph in charge. And for the next 10 years, Joseph was in charge. Now, now ask yourself, how often do you find yourself in contrary circumstances where no one can tell the difference between a good day and a bad day in your life because you just walk with God? You see, if you met Joseph, I don't think he'd been going, you should see what's happened to me. Only one time does he even bring it up, years later in jail. He says to a fellow, I was, I was unjustly accused. I was sold by my brothers. Maybe you could put in the good word with Pharaoh. And when that didn't work, he went right back to being the best kind of overseer in the prison that you could find. I mean, it, it's such a, you know, we all can worship when things are going our way, but, but could you worship like that if you got fired? You know? Or your kids didn't do as well as you hoped, or your wife walked out the door one day unexpectedly and you had nothing to do with it. Could you still worship then? Usually not. We usually then find great reasons. Arguing people go, oh, I'm so sorry. I, yeah, I know how you feel. Yeah, that's rough. That's tough. You got a bad break. But it's the same God who sits on the throne of our life. And Joseph, now you see Judah, man. Judah's lying. And sleep, he's sleeping with prostitutes. He's, you know, he's divorced and, and, and sorrow and guilt. He can't be home. He's back in the world. And then there's Joseph. He's a slave, whistling Dixie, man, doing worship. Doing so fine that everyone around him sees it and knows it and is aware of it, is amazed by it. Now, the devil is not going to leave a guy like that alone, right? And, and so it shouldn't surprise you that we read in verse 7, it came to pass after these things. So as time progressed and Joseph became, you know, a trustworthy servant and his reputation, the blessings of God were evident, after these things that his master's wife, cast a longing eye on Joseph, who we just read in verse 6, was handsome, tall, good-looking. And she said very subtly, hey, come lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. He has committed all that he has into my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you're his wife. How could I then do this great wickedness and sin against God? So look, if the enemy can't get you with sorrow and suffering, maybe he can get you through something else. And you know, you can just see the enemy like coming out of his latest devil meeting, you know, with, with guns blazing, you know, and he's got another angle. He, he's got another angle. I, I, I remember reading in, in The Temptation in the Wilderness of Jesus there in Luke 4, 13, that when the temptations had ended, that the devil left him until an opportune time. He didn't leave for good. He just went, all right, I'll wait till the next round, you know, get some air, get some food, I'll be back, right? And the enemy came back. I mean, Joseph could have given it up just by the way he was treated. He did fine. So now the enemy brings this next temptation, a seductive advances of an older woman whose husband had made himself a eunuch for his job. He was handsome, and she was a desperate housewife. So Mrs. Potiphar was as impressed with Joseph as Mr. Potiphar was, but for an entirely different set of reasons. And she wasn't subtle. She was pretty much in your face, lie with me. And Joseph refused. In fact, if you read verse 10, it says, day by day, Joseph, over a period of time, just kept saying no. 
and she wasn't taking no for an answer. Now, you know, be with Joseph here for a minute. He's in his maybe early 20s. You know, he's a man with, with sexual drives, as any 20-year-old young man might have. He's far from home. He's got himself well established. Things are going his way. He could have easily taken advantage of the situation for his own gratification, you know. And she comes out every day dressed to kill. Hi, Joseph. You can just see her, you know, I don't know. The nod, the wink, the stare, how you doing? And Potiphar's wife still has lots of descendants, you know? And there's still a lot of young people who have to face that temptation as the test of their commitment to the Lord. Just the way it is. So Joseph's response is awesome. First, he recognizes his position. He says, I have been entrusted by your husband with a great responsibility and accountability. I can't violate that trust. He's a, he's a, he's a guy with great fidelity, great honesty. You can trust Joseph with whatever you would give him. Secondly, he recognizes who he is. He says literally, how could I, as God's child, do this wickedness against the Lord who loves me? How could I do something like that? He calls it great wickedness and sin. I can't do that. That is great wickedness and sin. Now that's quite a mouthful coming from a 20-year-old good-looking guy to an older woman who is more than willing to accommodate his youth. I can't do this great wickedness and sin. You know, oftentimes we, we find even in counseling that people's view of, of sin is insufficient to keep them from it. You know, they don't hate sin enough or they don't see it as problematic enough or it doesn't register in their hearts as, as wicked enough before God to say no to it. They don't view sin as wicked because so much that we see around us seems to be sin with prosperity. And so, you know, it, it is easy to develop a mentality that sin's fine. Or it's not that big of a deal. But, but notice the big deal that it is, Joseph. I can't do that great wickedness and sin against God. I can't do that. He is convinced. He sees it in black and white. There's no shades here. And he sees it as an affront against God. How can I do this wickedness, this great sin against God? You know, ultimately, and I think, I think if, as a young person, if you can grab a hold of it, it'll help you. You know, sometimes we think we can get away with stuff because no one sees it. But God always sees it, doesn't he? He always sees it. You know, I might smile at you and curse you when you turn around. And I'll think I got away with it. And the Lord will write it right down. I saw that. I saw that. I heard that. You know, David um, realized it with the whole issue with Bathsheba. You know, he, he said in his Psalm 51 prayer, against you and you only have I sinned. He wasn't suggesting that he hadn't violated Bathsheba or her husband, Uriah. But ultimately, it was, it's sin against God. You know, it's God's rules. It's God's law. It's God's demands. And, and I think one of the keys to Joseph, if you want to learn from him as far as walking with God, he had a great fear of the Lord in his life as a young guy. You know, you didn't have to be there to look over his shoulder, hey, that's not right. No, he knew that. And, and, and he knew sin was wicked and he, he knew God was good. And, and he took it seriously. And, you know, we read that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or the beginning of knowledge. Uh, I think uh, Proverbs 8 says the, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And Joseph hated evil. You know, if you can hate evil, man, you can do well with the Lord. But if you can accommodate evil, mm, you can have a hard time. Because that door's always like half open, isn't it? Joseph didn't ever allow the door to, to open. And, and, you know, he was convinced he had to serve God. I, I make a comparison between Joseph and Moses. You know, when Moses, um, who, who knew, either he knew because he was raised by his mother and father for a few years and they told him, or God had just shown him, but Moses knew that he was going to be God's deliverer. He was pretty sure that everyone should have noticed it by now. And when the time came, or he thought the time had come for him to take over, and when there was that, that fight, you know, and he, he killed the Egyptian, if you'll read the story, it says he looked one way and then he looked the other. Never did look up. He, he killed the guy because he figured nobody saw him. He looked this way, nobody there, they killed him. But he forgot to look up. And he would have to spend the next 40 years on the back of the desert learning that God knows what you're up to. And God's watching. And then he would be able to come back and say to Pharaoh, well, you know, you're messing with the Lord. <laughs> he could speak for God then. But before, all he did was look around. Joseph doesn't have that problem. 40 years, Moses has to learn what Joseph already knew in his early 20s. And look again at verse 10, because we read there, um, day to day that he did not t heed her to lie with her or to be with her. And, and it's a different 
application. It literally means to have sexual relationship with her or just to spend time in the same place with her. He determined his best move was not to be anywhere near. Not like the alcoholic who goes to the bar and says, yeah, I'll have an orange juice, trying to hang around. Dumb, you're going to fall. Stupid, stay away. It's your weakness, don't go there. Joseph just figured, I'm not going anywhere near this woman. I'm going to stay as far away from her as I possibly can. He, he didn't allow himself a place of difficulty. He just wanted to serve the Lord. Pretty smart young guy, don't you think? But, but convinced that God's ways were best. Now watch how quickly we start with this. Let's finish this up. Verse 11. So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he, oh, verse 10, that he wouldn't heed her, lie with her, or be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work that none of the men of the house were inside. And so she caught him by his garment. She said, lie with me. Seems like the only three words she knows. <laughs> but he left his garment in her hand. He fled and he ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house. She spoke to them and said, See, he's brought to us this Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me, and he fled, and he has gone outside. So the temptation did not diminish or subside Eventually, an opportune time came for this woman to hit on him again, and, and Joseph restored to step five. When in all doubt, run. Running works, you know? I think Paul said to Timothy, flee youthful lust. Use the same word, run. It's hard to be in trouble when you're running. Um, well, she was pretty angry. She has now showed up, and the old adage, hell, hell has no fury like a woman scorned, you know, comes to pass here. as She has Joseph's coat in his hand, and begins to rape, uh, cry rape and falsely accuses this wonderful young man, godly young man, of an unthinkable act. Unthinkable. Now, we read in verse 16, so she kept his garment with her until his master came home, and she spoke to him with words like this, and she said, the Hebrew servant whom you brought into me, uh, who you brought to us, has come into me to mock me, and it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. And so it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. And Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Now, I'll just throw this out to you to have you think about it. It appears that because rape was punishable by death in ancient Egypt and no time was spent thinking about it, that the actions of Mr. Potiphar were both merciful and maybe showed some doubt about his wife's accusations. He put him in a prison where the prisoners of the king were kept. It is a better place to be. It was a, a finer jail than you might have found yourself in. He didn't have him killed. Now, if it was your wife, and you believe that to be so, and you had the ability to put him to death, you wouldn't think twice about it today let alone in ancient Egypt. So his behavior seems to suggest that even he was a little doubtful about Mrs. Potiphar. Um, but nevertheless, either way, poor Joseph, you know, godly young man, 28 years old when this took place, is now in prison after 10 years of serving so faithfully and so well. Verse 21, as we get to the end here, but the Lord was with Joseph. Remember that verse and that, that little phrase? He showed him mercy he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison, and the keeper of the prison committed into Joseph's hands all of the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. And the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So again, second unfair place, 10 years later, and we read what? The Lord was with him. His mercy was upon him. God's favor is shown to him wherever he goes. And pretty soon he's the chief trustee in the jail. Now, you know, you might read this and say, well, I would rather not be so blessed than to get out. But, but again, it's Joseph growing where he's planted. You might be in a job tonight that you hate. And you want, you've been praying for God to get you out of there and you're not going anywhere. And you wonder why. Maybe you could just enjoy what God has for you. Enjoy the Lord's plans. Hate the job? Yeah, maybe. I, I don't think Joseph loved, he didn't go, I love the prison. 
But he loved the Lord, and he was sure that God had a purpose and a plan, and he could rest in God's purposes. So his faith remains strong. He is in jail for at least a year before we run into these two men that will be sent to him. But in that year, he becomes in charge of the prison, all because God's hands is upon Joseph in a very unfair life. And I don't want you to be able to separate the two. It's a very unfair life, as it reads. And yet, in every position, God blesses him, and Joseph sets out to be the best prisoner in the world. What a guy, don't you think? I'm impressed with this guy. He is terribly challenging. I hate him a little bit. <laughs> and we're just getting started. His best years are ahead of him. Father, tonight as we sit together, it is... It is certainly with conviction and convicted hearts that we, we think about how often, Father, we, we show up at church grumbling and griping about our day or our situation or the turn of events, and yet we get to somebody like Joseph, and there's not much we can say other than, man, we're glad we're not him. And yet, Lord, you, we, we find him to be such a great example of, of your work, and not that he didn't sin, but he certainly was a mature young man who stayed faithful to the Lord all of his days. And Father, that you might drive home to us that, that there is an opportunity for us to be like Judah or like Joseph. And both of them ended up in, in, in the family of God, but yet one really ruined his days and had little influence in his life and spent much of his time in the world and being destroyed by it. And Joseph, in the worst of places, found peace and joy and rest because he was convinced, God, that you're, you're the Lord. Your ways are beyond our finding out, but they're good. And you do all things well, and all things do work together for good to those who love you, the called according to your purpose. And so I pray that at, at this Thanksgiving season, maybe more than any other, Christmas time, as we head for a new year, if you should tarry, that we might somehow, Lord, learn from you to, to grow where you plant us, to be faithful where you put us, to spend less time analyzing our surroundings and more time worshiping our God, to spend less time complaining about our, our, our lack of need or, or, or complaining of our needs or lack and, and more time celebrating, God, what you've done, how faithful you are and how, how trustworthy you are for us. And maybe you and I, as, as God's people, can then find ourselves in a place where we read of our lives and the Lord was with us and he prospered us and he blessed all that came from our hands and, and the world around noticed and they saw God at work in us. If tonight you don't know the Lord, our pastors will be up front. We'd love to tell you about Jesus. He, he came so that you could live. He became our kinsman redeemer. He was God and yet he took human form. He didn't sin, but he died as all of us will for our sin, but yet he took those sins for us upon himself, buried them at Calvary, and then three days later rose to overcome them and offering life to those who believe in him. You need Jesus. You'll never get to heaven without him. You won't even get close. And if you don't have Jesus as your Lord tonight, you come and pray. But if you find yourself like Joseph in you know, such a difficult place and you feel like there's no way out, how about this being your way out tonight? You begin to worship the Lord and, and be the best at wherever God has placed you. Be a witness, shine as a light, rejoice every day. Be grateful, be thankful. And let the Lord use you mightily. And if you need prayer for, for that situation, we would love to just agree tonight in prayer with you that you're going to be like Joseph this year. And God's going to do great things in your life. And you're going to discover one day the purpose is why he dragged his feet and left you there. Or you've had to face it so much longer than you thought. But you'll be thankful then. God will have made himself known then. So you come and pray. And Father, we thank you this Thanksgiving for everything we have. We think about the, the millions of little children around the world that aren't eating tonight, that will die of malnutrition, that will have no long-term hope. We thank you that you will gather them to yourselves, but we pray that we might use our freedom and our great blessings well. And may we be those who would give to the poor and help those in need and pray. And so, Lord, 
in our abundance, help us to be more like you, we pray. In Jesus' name. Shall we stand? We love you tonight. Thank you for your goodness to us and for your word and for our fellowship with one another. Go before us this, this weekend. May uh, our family who doesn't know you hear of you. And if they won't hear, may they see you in us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a good Thanksgiving. Open up your word and let it speak to me. The purpose and the plan that you've designed is 